Hey everyone, thanks for coming out tonight in this warm summer night to come into a nice cool church service. We're glad to have you. Uh, we want to start out our service tonight with the song Jen Minnick is going to be playing the piano. She's going to play a song now. Uh, after the prayer list, she'll play a song before Bob comes to speak. So Jen's going to play for us right now. Amazing love, how can it be? What a great hymn. That was one of the hymns that I selected at my ordination uh, service. So that was very special. Thank you for playing that tonight. What a beautiful, beautiful hymn tonight. Well, if you have your prayer list tonight, we want to take a moment and uh, go over our prayer list tonight. Uh, first of all, an announcement that's not on your prayer list. We had a phone call today from a veteran that's struggling with his wheelchair. He's currently using duct tape to keep it together. And he was wondering if anyone in our congregation would have a larger size wheelchair that they could donate. So if you know, uh, and again, by larger size, I don't know the specifics, but a larger size wheelchair that you could donate, just get a hold of Terry or Janice in the office, and uh, we'll contact that gentleman. And uh, what a someone who served our nation, I think we should help him out if we can. So uh, I want to share that with you. Also, a prayer request that's not on your list tonight, we want to pray for Bethany. Um, that is Samantha Locke's sister. Bethany has esophageal cancer, and uh, she's going to the doctor here this week to find out uh, what the treatment's going to be. So we want to pray for her as well. Uh, we also, in mercy, we want to pray for Mary Ann Probst. Uh, also, we have the upcoming election in November. Uh, again, it's amazing when you turn the news on and they tell you how many days it is to the election. It is very, very quickly coming upon us. So uh, we can't start praying in November. We have to start praying now Amen. and pray for our nation, uh, the country of Israel, again, with new attacks from Hezbollah now uh, in the north. So we need to pray for Israel at this time. Pray for our Paris outreach this summer. Again, the Olympic Games are in Paris, and you're seeing the commercials on television uh, for all the athletic events going on. But we're going to have people from not only our church but other churches throughout the nation that are going to be over there witnessing uh, over there and sharing. And maybe, I don't know, Bob, if you got time tonight, but there's some neat, share some of that technology that they're going to have to witness. It is amazing, the technology that they're going to have to share the gospel with people uh, during the time of the Olympics this summer. So really be in prayer for that. Pray for Camp Choff. 
Uh, right now, they're having their Wednesday night service as we're meeting here now. Uh, Trent shared with us at the uh, staff meeting today that two young people were saved last night. And so really continue to pray for young people to be saved out at Camp Chaff. We're excited about what God's already doing out there. Uh, continue to pray for Julie Stewart as she continues to battle her lacrimal gland cancer. Uh, continue to pray as she has a second scan scheduled for today. So uh, we'll pray for the good report from that. And then tomorrow, her husband Scott is having eye surgery uh, tomorrow. Ray and Sue Beck for health problems. Uh, Jenny Ose for herself uh, because of a serious UTI. She's going to be seeing two doctors on Wednesday. Uh, that's today. So pray for her. Mark Bulger with health concerns. Jared Arnold with health issues. Uh, Charlene Sherry uh, for her sister Beverly Keefe with continued health issues. Jill Young uh, is diagnosed with cancer. She'll be taking radiation treatments for five days a week for 30 treatments. Uh, so after treatments are finished, they'll be look at more blood work to see tests and progress. So pray for Jill and Dan. Dan is Delaney's son. Jill is his daughter-in-law. Katie Anderson doing well after her hip uh, surgery. Surgeon's in the process of going over travel plans and when she can get back to Spain. Continue to pray for Barb Rich Creek as she goes through the uh, constant head and facial pain. Uh, Julie Ferris for her father who's in the hospital with MRSA. Uh, the infection is in his hand. They're going to have to take part of his hand and then do some skin grafts. So pray for that. Uh, Steve Karate scheduled for some minor surgery next week at Altman. Uh, Janice Voina, her grandson Landon, fell. Uh, and, and you know how it is when you fall, you put your arms out, and he broke his wrist and uh, arm right on the growth plate. And I believe he's nine years old. So really pray for him that that will heal up properly. Uh, we have a quote from A.W. Tozer, who hangs in our Hall of Fame right down in the end of the building in the North Hall there. God is looking for those with whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only the things that we can do ourselves. That's a great quote. Uh, A.W. Tozer is, uh, again, hangs in our Hall of Fame. And uh, he's buried, actually, if you ever want to see it. I, I, I've gone up to see his uh, graveside. His epitaph on his headstone is this, A.W. Tozer, a man of God. Wouldn't that be great if they could put that on all of our tombstones when we die, man or woman of God? And if you travel out of North Canton, uh, Main Street becomes 91, and it crosses 224, and there's a little white church on the corner, and he's buried back in there. And uh, it's a, he's got a special, special place there, and he's got a place here in, in our Hall of Fame, and, of course, a more special place with the Lord. He's been gone since 1963. Be in prayer for the family of Liz Reese. Uh, who passed away on June 14th. The service is tomorrow, June 20th, at Pacolet Funeral Home in Maslin. A calling hour is 11 to 1, and I'll have that service at 1 o'clock. So pray for the family, uh, and, and that all will go well, the Lord would be honored, and that uh, we'd be able to honor the life that she lived. She was a very faithful, faithful member. Uh, I'm going to share tomorrow at the funeral. I, I probably wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Liz Reese and the outreach that she had to my in-laws and their spiritual growth. So she was a sweet, sweet lady. Um, also for missionaries, Jim and Laura Hutchison, missionaries in Estonia. Uh, they have some praises and thanksgiving, multiple opportunities to talk about Christ, Lord's provision in a church property and its finances, our physical health and spiritual walk. Those are all praises and thanksgiving. Then prayer requests, summer outreach opportunities, new Bible studies, and a spiritual walk and physical health. Then on back, we have longtime missionaries, Tony and Julie Sullivan, to Australia. Uh, how many of you get our prayer list for our missionaries each month? How many of you pray for our missionaries every month? Okay. How many of you pray for them by the needs that they have on their prayer list? That's important. Uh, let me tell you an incredible story that I, I share with this when I talk to people about praying for missionaries. Sometimes we have this general prayer, Lord, be with all our missionaries. Well, he will because they're saved. He's with them. But pray for our missionaries by name and be specific. Uh, I don't know how many years ago, maybe 10 years ago now, I was in my office on a Wednesday morning, and I was praying through the last quarter of our prayer list of our missionaries, and I got to their name, and I prayed for them. And for some reason, the Lord prompted me to pray for their health. Now, where did I say they're from? Australia, if you were listening. They're from Australia. I walked from my office through to the old office complex 
And in the, ha- in the hallway in the office was Tony and Julie Sullivan standing right there. Now, we know each other just, of course, by name and acquaintance. And I said, what are you guys doing here? And they said, well, we're in the States. Tony's been having some health issues. And I said, you're not going to believe this, but I just got done praying for you by name for your health. So do you think that encouraged my prayer life? Absolutely did. So pray for our missionaries. Pray for every prayer need by name and be specific. That way it's a much easier way to show when God answers prayer. So let me encourage you to do that tonight. Well, let's bow our heads and let's pray for those on our list tonight. And then Jen will bless us with another song before Bob comes. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we're thankful that our hospital list is short tonight. We're thankful for the work that you're doing in the lives of our congregation and touching and healing those that are sick. Lord, each one on the list tonight, we've read by name to you. We've read by name what their ailment and malady is. And so we lift them up to you and ask that you would answer that prayer as we give it to you by faith according to your will. And that we would look and see your mighty hand work in the lives of people that we love dearly. Lord, we do the same for our missionaries, the Hutchinsons tonight, and we do the same for the missionaries in Australia, the Sullivans. Lord, that you'd meet the needs that they have in these prayer letters tonight, that we could pray for them by name with the special needs that they have. And once again, look for you to be active in their lives. Lord, we pray for the service tonight. We pray for Bob as he comes, Lord, that you give him the words to say with clarity as we talk again on this special issue of prayer this summer. And Lord, as he talks about the prayer of Hannah tonight, that our hearts and ears would be receptive and that we would leave this building different than when we came in. Lord, we're thankful for Jen and the talent that you've given her. We ask that you bless her in the next song that she plays. And Lord, then as we go from this place tonight, that we would go with blessing and grace. In Christ's name, amen.
<clears throat> Thanks, Jen. She's two for two tonight. Uh, that's the whole reason that we're here, isn't it? Because of how great our God is. I mean, that is just amazing. That is, that is my favorite song. Uh, seriously, it is my favorite song. When, uh, uh, when I was in Ireland, we, when we started a church, and uh, uh, that was one of the songs that we did. And there's nothing like hearing first-generation Christians from 16 different countries led by an Englishman who sings baritone. It, it just, oh, I can't even explain it. It just, uh, we would sing that a lot. That, how great is our God. And if we don't believe that he's great, we're pretty much wasting our time tonight, aren't we? Uh, we really are. Uh, and uh, so thankful for how great he is uh, and how great he is to us in spite of ourselves. And uh, so thankful. So thanks, Jen. I know she's already headed back to the choir. But we're going to be in 1 Samuel tonight. As you already saw, we're going to be speaking about Hannah tonight and the prayer and the commitment of Hannah. I, uh, we've been talking in, I, I don't know about your ABF, but my ABF, we're in the book of Esther. And... Um, yeah, I think it was, I can't remember if it was last week or, I, I can't remember, none, none of you have experienced this before, right? But you can't remember what you did yesterday sometimes. So, so Sunday was a few days ago. <laughs> I can't remember if it was this past Sunday or Sunday before. You know, we were talking about prayer and, and how Esther, I mean, the commitment that she made to three days of prayer and fasting. And, and, and I believe in both of those. Uh, although I don't look like it, I do believe in, in fasting as well. Uh, especially if we want real hardcore answers to our prayer. But we're not talking about fans, fasting, we're talking about prayer tonight. But you, were, you know, talking about how Esther, and she told Mordecai, um, have the Jewish people pray for three days as well. Now stop to think about that. Three days. Three days. Have you ever, I mean, your heart has just been broken. And have you ever just sat down and, and said, Lord, I am not stopping until I get a hold of you. And you look at your watch, you think you've been praying all day and it's been 30 seconds. <laughs> think about three days. Think about, I mean, but you know, here we are, we're talking about prayer during these summer uh, electives and and the importance of prayer and the examples of prayer, but we, ha we have to be committed as to prayer as well. And that's what I want to talk a little bit tonight. As we walk by faith, we may, and I would venture to say that most of us have endured uh, extended seasons of waiting on the Lord. Now, that's a whole other problem within itself. Because most, uh, I'm going to say most of us, because I would like to think that I'm not alone in this, but most of us are probably pretty impatient people. This afternoon, after uh, we had leadership uh, meeting this morning, and I had to go to Coshocton. So I'm, I left here, I left the church, and, and I had to go to Coshocton, and I knew I had to be back in time for tonight. So I thought, I'm going to go through McDonald's on Faircrest. We get impatient. Sometimes we even get impatient with the Lord. And some, but we have to wait sometimes. And that's a hard thing to do. And, and we, because we want the Lord to answer our prayers, we want him to move in our situation. But let me just tell you, as we go through not only tonight, not only the previous uh, uh, lessons, uh, but the, the upcoming ones in, uh, as well, if we will remain faithful, God will answer in his time. And that's, that's the hardest thing to really grab hold of when we want, as Jake said just a few minutes ago, we want to take care of problems ourselves. But we can't always take care of the problems ourselves. That's why God has given us the greatest weapon the, the, a Christian can have, and that's prayer. And it's probably one of the most underutilized weapons 
as Christ, that we have or utilize as Christians. And yet we want to take care of things of ourselves, but we will, we, sometimes we need to wait. Sometimes we have to understand that, that he's going to answer in his time and according to his will. And more often than not, I think it's difficult to walk by faith. You know, I, I'm thinking this afternoon, I, I was already waiting for two minutes to get my Big Mac. <laughs> I'm ready to go inside and say, do you guys need help? <laughs> Have you ever felt and at, looked at the Lord and said, Lord, do you need help on this one? <laughs> I mean, I, I, it can't be that difficult for you. Remember how great you are? I mean, let's get this prayer answered and let's get it answered right now. But that's not always the way it works because we do have to walk by faith and we have to trust the Lord to guide our path and to provide in areas of life that are beyond our control. There are times when our faith is tested and we may be aware of a need in our life, but the Lord doesn't provide an answer or solution immediately. And those are always the toughest, of course, to overcome. And in fact, we may have to walk by faith for an extended period of time. We could stand up here and give you example after example of people who've waited years and years for answers to prayer. But if our faith is not nurtured during these seasons in life, our faith can grow weak as well, and it might even fade. Today in 1 Samuel, uh, it deals with a woman of faith, a woman of faith. She faced a difficult season in life that lasted for an extended period, and one of the things that we know about this is we don't know how long that period of time was, and it really doesn't matter because time <laughs> is relevant. I mean, time, it doesn't matter if it's been five minutes or five years. When you're in the throes of heartache and despair and nowhere else to turn, the pain is as real whether it's five minutes or five years. So we do, when it comes to Hannah, we don't know how long of a, an extended period of time she had to wait, but there were times when she was probably tempted, like probably many of us, just to give up abandon our faith, but she remained committed to the Lord, trusting him to provide in his time and in his way. You know, walking by faith requires commitment. You are exercising your faith tonight by being committed to the Lord, not to come hear me, because most of you probably didn't even know I was speaking tonight. If you did, you might not have even come but it shows your commitment to the Lord to strengthen your faith. We, listen, all of us on staff, I'll, I think we could, we, we don't think this way, believe me. We are here because we want to be here. But we could probably find other things to do just like everybody else. But no, we're here to strengthen our faith as well. We're committed to learning on how to rely on God for what he has for us. So I want to just look at a few things here tonight. I'm talking about the, the details that Hannah went through the seasons of her life and how she was able to overcome that. The first thing that we see is the difficulty that Hannah faced. And that's in the first eight, eight verses. And uh, Jerry, I forget, are the verses listed before or after? Okay, very good, thanks. Because I'm, I'm not, just follow me and we'll, we'll do it. So, uh, But the, er, the, the, the opening verses of that text here uh, reveal the difficulty that Hannah was facing, her ability to maintain faith against those overwhelming odds, I think offer encouragement to us even today. And that's one of the great things about scripture and about the Bible is that it's just as relevant today as it was in Hannah's time. So this is not some outdated process that we're looking at or some outdated idea that won't work today. It's just as relevant today as it was back in her time. First of all, we see that she was barren. In verse two, and he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah and the name of the other, Penaniah. And Penaniah had children, but Hannah had no children. So here's 
Elkanah had two wives, Penaniah and Hannah. Penaniah had children. Hannah wasn't able to have children. Verse 5 shows that the Lord had shut the womb of Hannah. She wanted to have children, but she was unable to. And this was a situation that was completely out of her control. And unfortunately, there are those who can identify uh, with her uh, uh, concerning this as well. Some women do want to have children, but for some reason, they're just not able to. And while we all can't relate directly to Hannah's difficulty, we have all, I think, faced situations that were beyond our control, that we had no, no ability to control it. Regardless of how much we desired a different outcome, we were uh, unable to change the circumstances that we find ourselves in. So we see, first of all, that she was barren. We see, secondly, that she was belittled as well. In verses 6 and 7, And her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, so there's where we get that extended period of time from. We don't know uh, exactly how long. But as, uh, and as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. So get the picture here. The family dynamics created a difficult environment for Hannah. Now, once again, we're seeing an example of an individual problem that Hannah was going through, a personal problem that Hannah was going through, that here um, uh, Penaniah was taking advantage of and really giving her a hard time. And I have a feeling that there must have been some jealousy among those two, uh, both, you know, married to the same guy. And Penn and I used Hannah's uh, barrenness as a means to ridicule her and to belittle her. And this added, I think, to the misery and to the despair that Hannah felt. I mean, she wanted to bear, especially if you consider the, uh, the historical context of the time it was important for women to bear children. And so she couldn't. And so now Penaniah was just really rubbing it in like, you know, salt into a wound here. And it added to that, not only was she unable to bear children, she had to endure the mockery and the ridicule of Penaniah. You know, this is an example of what the enemy likes to use and to do to us. The enemy, being Satan, will use others to add to our despair during our times of difficulty. Not everyone is, number one, going to appreciate what you're going through, and number two, even care what you might be going through. And some people might just not like you. I can't imagine that. But they might not like you and be like a Penaniah and really ridicule and give you a hard time. See, you deserve everything that you're going through. No one's probably ever heard anything like that when you're going through a difficult time in life or uh, whatever. You know, people, will, people are, can be very mean at times. And that's what was happening here. And the enemy, being Satan, can do that and will do that to us. This is just one of the tactics that he uses to challenge our faith. God, I have a problem here and I'm coming to you to, to get answers for this problem. And here I am, I'm telling everybody that I'm praying and that I'm, I'm waiting on you, but not only that, but they don't care what I'm going through. And matter of fact, they're even giving me a hard time about what I'm going through. And not only that, they're saying it's my fault what we're going through. And, you know, so after a while, your faith, okay, the Lord just really doesn't care about me. You know, he really doesn't understand. He must not understand what I'm going through, because if, if God really understood what I'm going through, he would answer my prayer. See, that's what Satan will do to start challenging your faith. And no doubt we've all dealt with mockery, with ridicule at some time or another in our lives. And these times are not enjoyable, but they're, they're no reason to abandon our faith. Once again, I want to stress that word commitment. We are committed to our faith. We are committed to our faith. If you are not committed to your faith, Satan will see that opening to start challenging your faith. 
So our Lord endured great mockery. He endured ridicule as well, and he came to save, and yet his faith prevailed as he remained committed to the Father's will uh, for our salvation. Now, don't forget, here was, you know, we, we look at the ministry of Christ, which was an extended period of time of three years. And then, well, you know what? I, I said three years, but remember, even as a child, his own parents didn't understand sometimes what he was doing. Remember the example of when he was in the temple? I don't know what Christ's early life necessarily was like. There's not a whole lot uh, uh, in scripture on that, but we do know that his parents, as, as he was a young boy in the temple and he was speaking and he was teaching and he wasn't supposed to be doing that. And, and yet we get to the three years of his ministry and what was that? It was, it was a test of faith, all three years. And not only did Satan himself come to Christ to, to tempt him, but his own, Satan used his own disciples against him at periodic times. And then we see Christ coming to the Garden of Gethsemane and he shows full commitment for his, his faith. Now, I, I, I want you to understand something. I, I stress this in my ABF class, so they understand what I'm saying and I, I, I don't want to get too far out here and not, not or say something I shouldn't, but... I fully believe that in the Garden of Gethsemane, Christ was fully human. And he could have said, Lord, if yeah, he did, he said, Father, if, if there's another way, let's do this. I'm paraphrasing, by the way. You know what? But then he had to show the commitment that he had to his own father by saying, but I'll do your will. He was committed to the will of the Father during the most horrendous time in his life. And then, of course, we, we could go to the, uh, um, the cross, but we won't. All I'm saying is that here was Christ. He remained committed to the Father's will so that we can be saved, so that we can say how great is our God. So not only was she belittled, but she was broken as well. We see in verse seven. And as he did so year by year, <clears throat> you know, as, as you look at that, as he did so year by year. Do you know what Samuel's, what, what, the, what the scripture's telling us here? Who is the he that, that this is talking about? Who, who's the he and as he did so year by year, that year is, is the Lord, is God. When she went up to the house of the Lord, she, she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. As, as, as the Lord continued to close her womb. Now, the, the ridicule became so intense that it began to have an adverse effect on Hannah's health. And in her despair and her brokenness, Hannah wept and refused to eat, of course. The burden she faced had gotten to the place that it dominated her life. And Hannah's faith was being put to the ultimate test here. And I'm sure that we can all relate to Hannah in this regard as well because most of us have dealt with stress and worry. And if you haven't dealt with stress and worry, then you're not living, okay? I would say that all of us to some degree have dealt with stress and worry at some point, which eventually will begin to affect our health. And in these moments, we are even more vulnerable um, to attack from the enemy. In our moments of deepest despair, he seeks to destroy our faith and cause us to question God's love and, and faithfulness. And he wants us to believe God no longer cares about our needs and our cares and how easy it is for us to start to question then. Lord, do you really care. But then we see the second thing here is the determination that Hannah possessed. And that's in verses 9 through 16. And thankfully, Hannah did not give in to her brokenness and she did not give in to despair. And rather than give in to defeat, she rose above in faith. 
And we see that in her fervent prayer in verse 10. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Have you ever been to the point where you've just fallen on your face in bitterness of soul? And, and, and you know, we see that in, in, in uh, um, Paul tells us that sometimes we don't even know how to pray. And yet the spirit speaks for us because we're so broken. We're so hurt. We're, we just don't know where to turn. And that's where Hannah was and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Have you ever gotten to, have you ever come to the place where you've wept sore over a prayer request or a need in your life or in the need of somebody else's life? Maybe a, a child or a parent or a grandchild. I mean, have you, have you, has it bothered you that much that you just cried tears unto the Lord? You know, Hannah's situation had not changed as of yet. She remained in deep bitterness of soul, but she refused to give up. So she poured her heart out into the Lord, weeping before him as, as she shared her heart's desire. I mean, she knew she had a desire here. She had a need, really. It was a need. And Hannah knew that God alone could meet her need and resolve that situation. And I know that while this is not an enjoyable place for Hannah to be, it was right where she needed to be at that moment in life. And can you imagine that? I mean, if you've gone through trials in your life, it's easy to look back sometimes and say, now I understand why I went through that. Now I understand what God was trying to do. But you know what? Sometimes we're going to get through a situation and we're going to look back and we say, okay, I don't understand this. <laughs> you know, God could have taken care of this years ago or God could have taken care of this yesterday or what, what, what was God trying to teach me? Was God trying to teach me anything? And don't think yourself so highly that everything you go through is uh, necessarily just for you. It might be for somebody else uh, so that you can be an example and an encouragement that you're, because of what you're going through, you are an example and an encouragement to somebody else. We, sometimes we may never know why we're going through what we're going through, but we see the prayer here of Hannah. She, she was right where trials and adversity are never, never enjoyable, but they do have the potential to bring us closer to the Lord. And that's what was happening with Hannah. Instead of getting, you know, backing off from the Lord, instead of doubting her faith, she was becoming closer to the Lord and depending more and more on him. And typically, we'll either seek the Lord, knowing that he alone can meet our need, or we'll grow bitter, feeling like he's abandoned us. Uh, I, I, many of you in here, just like Jake and I, could give you example of people who we visited, and they don't want anything to do with church anymore. They don't want anything to do with God anymore because they went through whatever it is they went through, and they blame God. Instead of allowing God to work through that situation, they became bitter and they got away from the Lord then. But Hannah didn't. And I pray that we will do as Hannah and make our requests known to the Lord. You know, and her, like, I'm referring to Jake here again. Sorry about that. But you were talking about praying specifically. Listen, Hannah was praying specifically. She had a specific prayer that she was praying about. It is so easy. Most of us pray maybe three times a day. Lord, bless this breakfast. Lord, bless this, bless this lunch. Lord, bless this dinner. Thank you. Amen. Maybe four. Lord, I'm trying to get out of bed this morning. Can you just help me put one foot right in front, you know, to roll out if I have to roll out. But Lord, just help me a little bit to get out. Maybe we pray four times. I don't know. But very seldom are they specific. Well, Hannah's was specific as well. And you're, you're going to see through the examples of, uh, of the prayer lives of these that we're talking about this summer, most of them are specific. Her faithful promise is what we see next. Verse 11, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou would indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid 
and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child. That's pretty specific, okay? Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. You know, in the midst of great despair, Hannah remained committed to the Lord. She wanted a child more than anything else, and yet she, uh, uh, she promised that the Lord would grant her request. What was she going to do? Give him back to the Lord. She was, uh, now, you know, we may be thinking, okay, well, you know, we just had baby dedication not too long ago, and we made that same kind of commitment. We're going we're gonna to give our children to the Lord. We're going to try to raise our children just like the Lord would want us to raise him, and we want him to be, our children to be faithful, and on and on and on. No, uh, she made that commitment. Lord, he is yours. He's yours. Whatever you want to do with him, he's yours. Now, I don't know about you. You know, I, I, that, that would be tough. Honestly, that would be, that would be hard. Uh, especially when you've wanted something so bad. And then you turn around and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to give him right back to you. And he's yours. And you have to understand, it's not that he's yours. No, he is yours. You do with him what you want. I am only the steward of him. I am only taking care of him until you do what you want with him. And that's all, that's, so she's, she, the most precious thing that she wanted, she's giving back. I would have a, I have three daughters and five grandkids. You can have my daughters. I have a hard time with those grandkids, though. <laughs> no, I'm just, if you're watching, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, honestly, here she was. she was. She was willing to give that. She was willing to offer the Lord the one thing that she desired most in life. And she would allow her son to live. Not, and, and, and you're going to see this a little bit later. Uh, I, I think someone else has talked, or... Uh, talking about Samuel's uh, prayer life or something. But anyway, uh, she would allow her son to live with Eli, the priest, and serve the Lord there instead of actually raising him at home as well. And although Hannah had likely dealt with bitterness and jealousy in the past, she had actually, because of the despair that she was in, because of her, uh, her need to rely on the Lord to answer the prayer, she had, got, she had come to the place in her life that she depended so much on the Lord that her faith had grown. And because of that, she was willing to submit herself to the Lord's desire. Her jealousy and selfishness was replaced with great faith and commitment to the Lord. You know, are we willing to submit ourselves to that uh, uh, kind of a commitment to the Lord as well? Are we willing to offer our children in the service of the Lord, regardless of where that might lead? And, and you know, that requires great faith. And not only our children, I'm talking about ourselves. Are we willing to commit ourselves? Are we willing to commit our time? Are we willing to commit our tithe, our finances? Let me just stop there just a minute. <laughs> because here's a great test of your faith and of your prayer life. I don't know who tithes and who doesn't. That that's, has nothing to do with me. But I will tell you this. If someone says, I cannot afford to tithe, that is a little bit of a lack of faith. Actually, it's a whole lot of lack of faith, but I'll just say it's a little bit of lack of faith. Amen. Because here's what you do. God wants our commitment. And the Lord says, I, I want you to tithe. Okay, Lord, here's my tithe. And I actually have cash in my pocket for one reason. <laughs> here's $20. I don't know what your tithe would be, but here's $20. And Lord, you know I cannot 
afford, quote, afford to give? Well, first of all, you aren't giving. That, that would be the first place that we have to start because we don't, have to, we don't understand that it's not ours to begin with. If we look at it as ours, then we are going to hold on to it a little bit more. But see, it's not ours. It, he, he gave it to us. And all he's asking is for us to be committed enough to him to give a little bit back. So here's a test of your faith and your prayer life. Okay, Lord, you know that I maybe for one reason or another, I can't afford. <laughs> maybe I've overextended myself. Maybe I just don't make very much money or whatever, the, whatever it is that you think in your mind, I can't tithe. Say, Lord, okay, I want to be committed to you. I want my faith to grow. Lord, you have to meet my needs now. And you, you do it. And guess what? It will keep you on your knees. I'm not, gonna get, I'm not one of these guys that says, give, and God's going to give back tenfold to you. You know, he might give you tenfold in health. I don't know, but he's not going to give you riches beyond your dream just because you give some televangelist $20. Amen. Okay, that doesn't work that way. But if we will be committed to the Lord, this is, and this is just one way to, to, you know, because it can be a challenge. Believe me, it can be a challenge. And I'll have to tell you, I have to be honest with you. I, I am going to, now, now I'm, you know, telling on myself, but to make sure that I don't forget or think, boy, you know what, I need to pay this off or I need to do this or I need to do that. I just have it automatically coming out of my bank account. <laughs> now, that might be a lack of faith on my part, but I don't, I, I believe that the Lord's going to meet the need because I go to him and say, Lord, listen, you told me to do it. You've told all of us to do it in your word, so I am depending on, and sometimes you've got to get on your knees to say, Lord, how are you going to meet this need? Once again, a commitment. And once again, it's something like that. We can make that promise to the Lord. Lord, I'm going to do it, but you have to meet my needs. And then also we see her focused presence in verses 12 through 16. As Hannah prayed before the Lord, she caught the attention of Eli. And he watched her, and he saw her uh, mouth moving, but her, he didn't hear any words. And I'm, I, once again, you can read the first 20 verses of, uh, of uh, chapter 1 of 1 Samuel, and you'll see all of this. But Eli assumed that she had been drinking and had come into the tabernacle drunk. Uh, and he went and confronted Hannah, and she assured him that she had not been drinking, but was pouring out her heart uh, in desperation unto the Lord. Her faithful commitment and desire was noticed and recognized. Other people saw her despair. Other people saw her faithfulness. Other people saw her commitment. Do you know we sometimes never know what the person sitting in front of you, behind you, next to you may be going through in their life? Sometimes we may never know, but sometimes their family might or their friends might or their next door neighbors may or their coworkers may. And yet, are we committed enough to be faithful? Are we committed enough to turn it over to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't understand. I don't understand why I'm going through this or I don't understand why I uh, um, uh, have this issue or this problem or going through this trial, but whatever it is, Lord, I'm going to be committed. I'm going to be faithful. I can tell you right now, people will notice. People will notice. You may carry a heavy burden that no one else knows or understands. Some may be aware of it, but... So we, we can't relate to everything that someone goes through. We just can't do it. We've not experienced that pain or that heartache that some people have gone through. 
And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, there may even be those who don't appreciate the burden that you're going through or will even hinder your pursuit before the Lord. And in times of doubt and accusations, we have to remain focused on our need and persistent in prayer to the Lord. Even if no one else understands, guess what? The Lord does. Even if no one else does, the Lord does. So then the third thing that we see is the delight, the delight that Hannah received. That's verses 17 through 20. We don't know exactly how long Hannah desired a child, but we do know that she had dealt with this burden for several years. And it was her persistent faith and her commitment to the Lord eventually that brought the result that she desired. We notice that her petition was granted in verses 17 through 18. Then Eli answered and said, go in peace and God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And he said, let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat and her countenance was no more sad. You know, following her time of prayer at the tabernacle, Hannah's life began to change. And listen, there is nothing wrong. And and this is where most prayers get answered. It's on your knees at home. I understand that. But there's also nothing wrong with coming down an aisle on a Sunday or on a Wednesday or whenever it is. Uh, You know, our church is open actually, well, seven days a week actually, because we're open Saturday. There's nothing wrong with coming in here during the week and just say, I want to just kneel at the altar and I just want to pray. I just want to pray. There's nothing wrong with that at all. And so here, uh, her, she had prayed at the tabernacle and her life began to change. As of yet, she hadn't even conceived a child, but she now enjoyed peace from the Lord. Can you imagine that? I mean, stop to think about that just a minute. Her prayer had not been answered, but she had peace. She didn't even know when the prayer was going to be answered. All that she was told was, it'll be answered. And guess what? She had peace. Sometimes, I mean, well, not sometimes, but isn't it wonderful for those of you that have experienced this before, that you have fallen on your face before the Lord day after day and maybe year after year, and then all of a sudden, a peace that passeth all understanding just goes over you. You say, okay, okay, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know when you're going to do it, but okay, you've given me that assurance that it's all going to be okay. Part of it is because we've come to the realization that he's going to answer it his way and not necessarily our way. So that battle between our pride and our desires and what God wants for our life has been taken care of. And now we're in tune with the Savior and with the Lord for his will for our life. And that's where Hannah was here uh, in this decision. And so she, she had gone, Eli had offered his blessing and Hannah's hope was renewed. She began to eat again. Her countenance was filled with joy instead of sadness. And once again, she didn't understand all that was going to be. But life will have its share of difficulties and trials. We all know that. We've all experienced those. And we're not promised a life of ease, but the believer is promised a constant companion in Christ. We are promised that a constant companion in Christ. And the Spirit can bring peace to our hearts even while the storm rages. And that's a a wonderful thing to be able to, to, uh, uh, you know, can you imagine here the Lord was in, in, in the boat? You know, everyone else was about going crazy. He's asleep. Peace. Where's the peace? The Spirit can bring peace. You know, if you're burdened, bring your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. But we also see her praise was offered in verse 19. And they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to the house of Ramah. You know, bear in mind, at this moment, Hannah had had yet to conceive. She has received peace in her heart. 
but her prayer is not fully answered yet. And that, but that doesn't stop Hannah from praising and worshiping the Lord. Did you see that? The prayer hadn't even been answered, but she was still praising and, and worshiping the Lord. I'm convinced that uh, she's praising the Lord for what he's going to do. She's yet to receive the blessing, but she offers praise in advance. Uh, do you know that even in the valley, our Lord is good? Now, sometimes you'll see, especially if you're on Facebook and all this other stuff, sometimes you'll say you'll see somebody going through and writing a bunch of stuff, and, but God is still good. Well, God's going to be good anyway. God is always good. And he'll still be good even if our prayer isn't the answer the way that we want it. But he is worthy of our praise and of our worship, even in the midst of our trials. You know, we don't worship him uh, so he will answer our prayers. We worship him because he is Lord and sovereign of our lives. And he is great. Like that song that Jen played, how great is our God. He's great. He deserves our praise. Whether or not he even chooses to answer our prayer, we deserve or we should be praising him. If I never received another blessing or had another prayer answered, we would still or we should still be compelled to, to worship the Lord because of the salvation that he's provided for us. That in itself is worth our praise. But then also we see that her prayer was answered, verses 19 through 20. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore, it came to pass when the time was come about her after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, because I've asked him of the Lord. In his time, according to his plan, God answered Hannah's prayer. Now, she had dealt with this burden for several years, but God honored her faithfulness. Uh, God gave her a son. Samuel, and there will be uh, someone else will be talking about him. But God is faithful to hear and answer the prayers of the redeemed. He is, and he will. And he may not answer in the time frame that we want or even in the manner that we thought he should or would, but he'll provide in his time according to his will for our lives as well. Hannah's life was definitely a journey of faith. Her burden lasted for several years, but she continued to pray. Let me just ask you this evening, are you struggling for so, about something? Is there something in your life that you're going through? Have you prayed and prayed and seems like there's no answer? And are you on the verge maybe of giving up? Well, don't do it. Don't give up. Just keep praying. Be committed. And he knows he cares. Just leave your burden to the Lord. You know, um, we're talking about prayer. We're talking about a a burden, and you know, Jake mentioned that we have the Paris outreach coming up, uh, and that's just about a month away uh, from starting. And before John Loss even went to France, John had mentioned to me about the uh, Summer Olympics uh, now coming up, and uh, so you know, we just we talked about it and we prayed about it, and so I made a trip over to Paris and. Actually, not to Paris, over to Dragonion, where uh, uh, where they live. And uh, by by car, they live about ten hours south of Paris, uh, is where the losses have their church. And uh, so we started working on. It. We start John and I started praying about it, and then we got uh, Lewis McClendon involved, and uh, then we got James Browning involved. James is helping us out. James lives out in California. Uh, we have um, uh, Brian Berry helping us out. And so we, we kind of have put a team together. And every Friday, just about every Friday, not every Friday, but just about every Friday at 9 o'clock our time, we have a Zoom meeting, uh, California, Ohio, uh, Paris, and then wherever Brian Berry is. We never know where Brian's going to be. He can be in Ireland or he can be wherever. Uh, but we have, we have a, a Zoom meeting to, to talk about what's, what's going to happen 
in a month. And we have worked diligently and we have done everything that we can over and over. And it has been a lot of work and it's been a lot of prayer. And it's, we've had a lot of of uh, resistance uh, along the way. We're, we still have some resistance, don't we, Lewis? <laughs> we, we're still having some issues uh, that, that even now, but yet we've been working on this now for at least two years. And we're just now, and we don't even know how the Lord's going to answer. But we can praise him for what he's already been doing up to this point. And now it's up to him. It's up to him. And we just covet your prayers uh, I won't get into all the political issues that are taking place uh, in Europe right now and France, and uh, uh, but there are just some things that we really desperately need prayer for as we are just a few short weeks from uh, taking people, uh, I don't know, we have I think about 80 or 90 people over the, the course of the uh, Olympics that will be there uh, with us. So we just need your prayers. And one of the things that God has opened the door for uh, because of technology, uh, th matter of fact, I just found out, Lewis, Friday, uh, our tracks will be here. And I got a little concerned because the lady called me today and she says, I have your tracks to deliver. I think it's three pallets. And I said, three pallets? <laughs> How am I going to get three pallets of tracks to, uh, uh, <laughs> to Paris? And then she says, well, it might just be one pallet. I don't, I'm not sure. And I'm still thinking, how am I going to get one pallet <laughs> to Paris? But, but we, we've created a, a, a track that we're going to be passing out. And on that track, there's a QR code. We have set up a, uh, a Facebook page, and we've also set up a website uh, that people will, will scan this QR code and it will take them to our website and they'll be able to read the gospel in their own language. Whatever that language is, they'll be able to read it in their own language. Another thing that we're able to do is we're able to target specific areas of France that we can advertise our website and Facebook page to. So if we want to just hit the area where uh, the basketball team is playing, anybody that goes onto their uh, iPhone or their uh, smartphone, an ad will pop up for Paris 2024. Uh, if, we wanted to mark, if we wanted to market the entire country of France, we can do that. But we can, we can take it down to a specific building even. So uh, God has really opened up some doors and some people a whole lot smarter than me have been able to help us get all this set up. And we are just really looking forward uh, to what the Lord's going to do. And we're asking for your prayer. It, it, we're not going over there just to say we did something. We want to make an et eternal change in people's lives. And it's not going to happen without prayer. So we need you to pray. Not just for that outreach, because we have an outreach right here of our own, don't we? Right here in Canton, Ohio. So we need you to pray for the church. We need to pray. You need to pray for your neighbors, your family. Listen, be committed like Hannah was committed. And pray. And don't give up no matter how long it takes. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the examples that you give to us. Hannah was a real person who lived. She had real problems, and she had to depend on you. For years, Lord, she went through, as we read, she went through the ridicule and, and the despair and the crying out to you and not knowing where to turn. Lord, maybe there's someone like that here tonight. Father, we may not even know what they're going through, but you do. Lord, let them know in no uncertain terms that you are their Lord. Lord, no matter how you answer prayer, you are still great because you were great yesterday, you're great today, and you're going to be great tomorrow. So, Lord, we know all of that. Lord, just get us to the point to where our will is your will that our desire is your desire so that we can have that peace 
that passeth all under all understanding. And Lord, we just pray that you would guide and direct, meet the needs now. And we do pray specifically, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, for the Paris outreach coming up. And Lord, we're we're so close now to it. And Father, we've worked and we've worked, and Lord, we're just depending on you to answer the prayers of people so that we can see souls saved. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a great evening and thanks for being here.